There was a point where I was standing in a lecture hall uh, just before delivering a, a guest lecture. And I walked up onto the stage and my slides were showing in the background. So it contained lots of um, historical data around the environmental situation we are in. And I looked at all of these, these sort of faces looking back at me. And I thought, they know this. <laughs> they know all about this situation. They're growing up with this. And those figures just weren't hitting anymore. A few years back, uh, we took up a research project, uh, my partner and I, in, um, in Brazil. We were based in the, the city of, of Cuiabá, which is famous for being the gateway to the Pantanal. I mean, it's, it's a huge land area, so in total you're looking at sort of the, the size of, of France. Um, and it's, it's a wetland area. It attracts huge numbers of bird species. And there's also some incredible wildlife species there as well. The Pantanal is bordered on its eastern edge by the Cerrado. And a lot of the Cerrado has been turned over to big agricultural spaces. When, I'm, when I talk about agriculture, it's really not on a scale that I think we can easily understand uh, in Europe. I and mean, you have to imagine that these are fields that when you look at them, you can see the horizon, but you can't see the edge of the, the field. And it's just a complete monoculture. And there is nothing else in that space. And it is such a contrast with the Pantanal and this extreme biodiversity and these hundreds of species and all of the, the different plant life that you have. But everything that goes onto those fields, so all of the chemicals, anything that is used in those agricultural spaces drains into the Pantanal, into the river systems. And it's an international bio-industry. So it's there for, for the biodiesel industries. It's there for large-scale pig farming, for different parts of, of agriculture, but it's at a level that is very far away from how we, we imagine the farming industry to exist. There was one day where, where I asked my husband when we were out um, collecting uh, data, can we go and, and see them? I, re I really want to see these, these spaces with, um, with my own eyes. And we, we drove up to, um, to one of the fields and we parked up the car under the only tree um, it was on the edge of the field. It was the only thing offering any kind of shade, <laughs> as as far as you could, you could see. And I just remember getting out the car, and just feeling completely helpless. I just thought, God, what, <laughs> what can we do that is going to have any kind of impact on this? Like it just felt like. The whole situation is completely out of out of any kind of control that you could you could have. I felt helpless, absolutely helpless. The motivation to find wildness was was really driven by a need to to escape. My partner and I had just spent over six months traveling through lots of national parks in, in South and North America. And then we came back to the Netherlands and it was just so extreme, that, that difference, kind of coming back to 
all of this stuff and the rhythm of of daily life and um it felt very chaotic and so we started talking about an idea that that he'd had a few years before um of escaping to the woods <laughs> and building a log cabin and and it was a really strong dream of his um and I thought, you know what? I think we could do this. We came up with this idea of, of a wild year. And this basically involved trying to spend more time outside than we did inside to try and bring a bit of balance into our lives. If we wanted to keep working through this year, then the logical thing to do was to spend our time sleeping outside. And we also set ourselves the additional challenge that it had to be spread across every season. And those gave us the, the boundaries of how we would engage with the outdoors during this time. The earth says stop. The earth says stop, just for a moment, please, to find some space to pause and listen to the breeze. The earth says stop, while we try to figure out why so many are not hearing the cry of nature's shout. The earth says stop, take a break from all the running and turn to face the future, which insists that it is coming. The earth says stop so that it can do the spinning leaving you to sow the seeds in the conversation we're beginning I often talk about the wild year as as having a, a ripple effect and it was an amazing experience in itself, but the impact that it has had, it's found its way into so many of the decisions that, um, that I continue to make. What we began to understand is not to think about the natural world as this backdrop, but actually understanding that this is a living, changing system that we are woven into. And importantly, that as much as it has an impact on us, that we can have an impact on it. And it doesn't need to be negative. I would love for anyone watching this to take a moment to look out the window or even better to step outside and just take in the environment around them and see all of those tiny influences of the natural world that creep in at every opportunity they have. And I would love people to listen to it and to hear it. And then to take that and to take that experience and to take that feeling and understand that that is not separate from those decisions that are being made on paper. That the decisions that are being made have ramifications now and that they have ramifications for generations to come and that that somebody watching this might be in that privileged position to be able to say okay I make the choice to make a positive impact to take a positive decision for those generations to come
Thank you.